today I'm very excited to start the day with a bit of privacy. Um, when I asked Gautam to give this tutorial on differential privacy, I was very excited that he said yes, because um, I'm not sure if you've seen on, on his YouTube channel, he has a terrific course uh, which introduces differential privacy concepts. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to this tutorial. Gautam has had a number of contributions in the differential privacy field. Um, recently, he's worked a lot on fine tuning large models, um, as well as speeding up canonical algorithms like DPSGD. Um, and before I remember, I really enjoyed your paper uh, on Sever, which was a great read. So thanks so much, Gautam, for joining us. And the floor is yours. You have an hour. I'll probably eat into the break a little bit if people have questions. Thank you. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Nicola, for the uh, kind introduction as well as the invitation. It's really great to be here. I think there's a really cool initiative. So thanks, Nicola, for making this happen. Um, so yeah, like you said, I'm going to give an introduction to differential privacy. This isn't ne necessarily uh, a little bit abridged in the sense that we only have an hour, but the hope is this will take you from zero to how to train a machine learning model with privacy and what exactly that means. Uh, yeah, I'll point to additional resources afterwards if you want to learn more beyond just this one hour tutorial. So I don't think I have to motivate privacy too much to this audience, you know, secure and trustworthy ML, but I'll, I'll give a few examples more to illustrate the style of disclosure that we want to prevent. And let's let's start with uh, this XKCD comic, which we'll see in many uh, talks on privacy. You can see what happened here is an individual's at their computer. Uh, they typed into their email client, let's say, uh, long live the revolution, our next meeting will be at. And then they ask the machine learning system in their email to autocomplete this message. And you can see it suggested the docs at midnight on June 28th. Uh, and the joke here is, you know, as the caption says, essentially, it suggested someone else's secret as the completion to uh, their email, that someone else is going to be doing something potentially illicit at the docs at midnight on June 28th. And now their secret has been leaked. So that's a joke. It's, uh, it's just a, like a comic. So, you know, this isn't real. But uh, Reality resembles comedy sometimes, and there's a very nice uh, work by Carlene et al., which I'm going to use to illustrate this, um, which de demonstrates that uh, machine learning models can leak information about their training data, which is problematic uh, when this is sensitive. So here is a, from this blog post by some of the authors, uh, and they find that GPT-2 essentially copy-pastes a large fraction of its uh, text generations from the training data. Um, 0 0.1 is a fairly large fraction of your training data can be considered sensitive. Uh, it, it can be here because you'll see that uh, GPT-2 is trained on a bunch of stuff, which includes personal information, copyrighted content, and more. Uh, as one illustration from their paper, uh, here, if you prompt GPT-2 with the right uh, prefix, it'll give you out someone's uh, personal information, which here, for the purposes of their paper, they redacted. But if you feed it into uh, GPT-2, then it won't redact it for you. It'll, it'll tell you there. Uh, name, email, uh, contact information, fax number, et cetera. And then there's more. They also find in this blog post, they mentioned that uh, GPT-3, it can, if you prompt it the right way, then it'll spit out an entire page of uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which clearly has uh, some uh, important copyright uh, implications. So you might be thinking, okay, these are these massive machine learning models, which are very complex and they can maybe memorize their data because they have so many parameters and stuff like that. But at the other end of the spectrum, for even more basic things as well, uh, even basic statistics are, uh, are vulnerable. So I'm not an expert on biology related things, but there's something that people do, which is known as a GWAS study, which tries to find uh, correlations essentially between diseases and uh, genetic markers known as uh, SNPs, as they're called. Uh, and these are computed via various chi-squared statistics, associated p-values, very simple statistics. And this is a picture of what uh, Google Images tells me the GWAS study kind of looks like. You can see correlations between various chromosomes and, uh, uh, yeah, various different uh, diseases, I guess these are. So naturally, I don't have to tell you that when you're doing this sort of uh, GWAS study, this is highly sensitive medical data. For example, you may have people participating in certain medical trials, which are for socially stigmatic diseases. And they agree to participate in this, but they might not want the fact that they participate to be revealed because, uh, for example, something which is socially stigmatic like HIV AIDS, then maybe they wouldn't want their positive status to be revealed. 
Unfortunately, there is a very nice work by Homer et al. in 2008, which said under certain conditions, you essentially can identify who participated in such a study, uh, which has very significant privacy impl implications. Uh, this is known as a membership inference attack uh, to be able to infer whether someone was a member of the uh, data set which was used to do one of these uh, studies. And so th this was taken very, very seriously. For example, the US National Institutes of Health uh, essentially said, okay, this is a big problem. We're not going to give public access to a bunch of aggregates about genetic data. And now if you wanna be able to use this uh, scientific data, you need to go through a lengthy approval process. So this seems like a pro problem and we would like some way to do this sort of data analysis while respecting the privacy of the individuals who gave their data. And these are just two examples. There's many more. I could give another hour long talk just telling you all of these. For example, there's a Netflix prize. There was a major lawsuit against Netflix because they didn't properly anonymize a data set. Uh, I think this title tells you everything you need to know. Round two of an anonymization bug bounty. Um, this was this is about round two is also quickly broken as well. Uh, there was the Mass GIC uh, incident where the governor of uh, Massachusetts, Will Weld, was mailed his own uh, medical documents due to inability to anonymize uh, data appropriately. And uh, notably, one recent application has been in the census where uh, some census researchers essentially attacked the census and found they could attack the census and re-identify certain individuals. So the common trend here in all these cases is that it seems like large scale ML and statistics will inevitably violate individual privacy of the individuals who provided their data for the training data set. And we've seen time and time again, people still have a tough time believing this who don't work in privacy, but best effort or heuristic privacy measures won't and don't work. Um, uh, aggregation, only reporting aggregate statistics, things like anonymization. I think there's a great quote attributed to Cynthia Dwork, which says, anonymized data isn't. Uh, and, you know, really, I think this motivates that we need rigorous privacy guarantees in order to preserve user trust if we really want to do uh, private and reliable machine learning. So that brings us to the uh, definition or the definition of differential privacy, which was introduced by Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and Smith in a very influential paper in TCC 2006. Um, yeah, I'm going to first sort of, it, it, differential privacy, the first like five, 10 times I saw the definition, I was like, okay, this is a little bit uh, tricky. I don't know what's going on here. So I'm going to give you first this kind of illustration about how I like to think of privacy or maybe how you should think about privacy. Then we'll see the definition and discuss it. Uh, please don't, you know, if you if you find the definition a little bit intimidating, don't worry. You don't need to, like, understand all the intricacies. Again, that would take several hours to really, really understand why everything is the way it is. So, um, yeah, don't be too intimidated when you see it. But, again, to illustrate at a high level how I like to think of differential privacy and what it's trying to protect, imagine the following type of scenario. We have some data set X, which is fed into an algorithm, and it produces an output. Now we could imagine alternatively a data set X prime, which is similar to X, but it differs in say one entry, one entry has been added, let's say. It instead could be fed into X or M of X, the algorithm and produce an output. Now the idea is an adversary is going to be looking at the output of this algorithm. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out which one was fed into the algorithm, was it X or X prime. And if the adversary is unable to really figure out or ascertain which of the input data sets was X or X prime better than say random guessing, maybe with a little bit of advantage over random guessing, then we say the uh, algorithm that uh, produces output is differentially private. So this is like a little bit of an informal uh, explanation on how I like to think about it. And again, in words, we say an algorithm is differentially private if it's distribution over outputs, doesn't change much, after you added or removed one data point to the input data set. So let's, let's, that, that's a very odd and specific definition, uh, informal definition. Let's, let's investigate it a little bit. Why does that uh, imply any sort of privacy for the training data set to individuals? And I'm gonna walk you through an informal argument, which is formalizable in some way, but just to sort of convince you that this is reasonable. Based on this informal definition, dropping a user's data point is unlikely to change the input. Just that's, that's exactly what it says. The distribution won't change too much. Therefore, if you look at the output, you can't really tell whether a user was in the data set or not. And that's even in the very strong case where you know exactly what that user's data was. You can't figure out whether they were in the data set or not. 
that's a very strong guarantee. If you can't even figure out whether an individual was in the data set or not, then there's no way you can even guess anything about uh, what their data point actually was. And so that's, that's kind of informally why uh, it, it can prevent a lot of types of attacks, including a lot of things, which I'll, I'll give you a few examples uh, a bit later, but in particular, everything we've talked about so far uh, is prevented using differential privacy. Cool. So this is now where I'm going to introduce the actual definition again. It's a bit intimidating at first. I'm going to introduce it. We're going to discuss it a bit, but if it still goes over your head, don't sweat it. We can make it through the rest of this talk. We're not going to rely on it too heavily. Um, but the setup is the following. We're given a data set of N data points, uh, which are sensitive in some way. And these are given to what's known as a trusted curator. A trusted curator is someone who you trust um, in two ways. One, that it's okay that they see the data even if it's sensitive. Uh, and two, you trust them that uh, they won't report anything which is not differentially private. So this might seem like a strong assumption, like why would you trust anyone with your secret data? But for a canonical example, say for the US Census, you trust maybe the US Census to accept your uh, sensitive data, but you know and trust them not to just put this data out on the internet publicly for everyone and do responsible things. There are other models where you can look at where there's no trusted curator called the local model, but we're not gonna get into that today, but it can be more realistic at, in some settings. But yeah, we're gonna look at the trusted curator model and we're gonna say the curator, they essentially have an algorithm that takes in some data set, which is of the appropriate type and uh, it outputs something in the range space Y. Uh, and yeah, they're gonna output whatever this algorithm gives on the uh, data set, which is sensitive. So this is the definition, which again is a bit of a mouthful. Um, there's something missing still, but we'll get to it. Um, we say that an algorithm is epsilon delta differentially private or DP for short, if for all data sets, X and X prime, which differ in one entry, that's neighboring. Uh, you, I, I showed the picture before where you add or remove one data point. And for all events, uh, which are subsets of the range of this algorithm, we have the following uh, guarantee. Again, this is a little bit uh, intimidating at first, so don't sweat it if this uh, doesn't make full sense. We'll, we'll discuss it a little bit more. Uh, and, you know, again, keep in mind the intuition which I gave there, which is how I would describe this in words. Uh, the algorithm's distribution over outputs that it can give doesn't change much if you add or remove one data point. Cool. So let's, let's investigate this definition a little bit more and uh, look at some of the salient features of it. So the first thing you can see is, let's, let's, let's ignore delta, pretend delta doesn't exist, it's zero for now. First of all, you'll see that it kind of bounds the multiplicative increase in probability of any event. Like this is the probability that uh, S happens on data set X, and this is the probability that S happens on uh, data set X prime. And you can see that there's this multiplicative bound on how much more likely it can be. It's not gonna be a million times more likely, it's gonna be E to the epsilon times more likely, which is fairly small if epsilon is say small. And uh, there's a small additive change, which is permitted as well. But may basically, you should mostly think of it as this multiplicative increase in the probabilities. The, the, the most important and one of the most useful things here is this is a quantitative definition in the sense that you can have stronger privacy if you set epsilon and delta to be smaller, and it's weaker privacy if epsilon and delta are larger. So say epsilon and delta equals zero, you can sub it in there. that will just ignore the data set. Um, if you set epsilon and delta to be, say, infinity, then you'll see that uh, this, this captures any algorithm. There's no, and any algorithm you've run is infinity comma infinity differentially private, for example. And to give you an idea of how these two play in, so let's, let's look into the quantitativeness of this. So you see this e to the epsilon, it's a little bit odd, but for small epsilon, you can think of that as roughly, uh, you know, one plus epsilon if you have a, so it's a small multiplicative increase if you have a small epsilon. Uh, and that's how much the probability of any event can increase. People often, people often ask, how big should epsilon be? Uh, the rule of thumb, something in the neighborhood of around one is reasonable. Uh, sometimes you'll see smaller, sometimes you'll see larger. I think the alarm bells in your head should go off if you see something greater than 10, because e to the 10 is a huge number. But even sometimes things as large as eight can give reasonable privacy guarantees. We can discuss that a bit more offline, but roughly you should think maybe one, two, three, that's pretty strong privacy. Uh, delta, you can think of as, in some informal sense, the probability of a potential total privacy failure. Like, for example, think with probability delta, we just give up and output the entire training data set. Some massive privacy violation uh, is what could happen. So, as a consequence, 
this delta, we typically want it to be rather small, like at most one over n, where n is the data set size, but preferably smaller. So good, this is a lot of uh, discussion here, but roughly speaking, you should take away from this slide that it's a quantitative notion of privacy, which depends on epsilon and delta, and smaller equals more private. Uh, there's a bit more discussion I want to get here in the sense that there's two, there, there's many notions of differential privacy you've heard, uh, maybe the number of important ones, in my opinion, is about like on the order of five different notions, but today we're going to be focusing on sort of the OG ones, uh, pure and approximate differential privacy. Here differential privacy is when delta equals zero, uh, this is kind of the one that was defined in the original Dwork et al paper, uh, but then the delta, that was introduced in a, another Dwork et al paper in the same year, but that's often called approximate differential privacy. And the, the intuition here is it can sometimes be very, very hard to preserve the probability of absolutely every event in the sense that the original definition of pure differential privacy, even if you have an event which happens with probability, uh, you know, 10 to the minus uh, 100 or something, you still have to have this very strong guarantee that, that somehow you have to preserve the probability of that event. So this, this, that can be a bit restrictive sometimes, and this delta was introduced to allow Basically, maybe roughly speaking, you think uh, events with probability which are much less than delta, you don't really have to worry about those. And uh, you know, they're, they're not really things you have to worry about with privacy. And these turn out to be qualitatively different notions in the sense that there's some algorithms which work uh, for approximate DP, which don't work for pure DP. Um, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about uh, when to use different definitions a bit later. Uh, a few more just minor notes. One is that this is a symmetric definition. You might be wondering why is there an upper bound but no lower bound? If you just swap the location of X and X prime, effectively you have the lower bound as well, but this is a more succinct and common way to see it. Um, and finally, I've talked about, you know, I've, I've sort of muddled my terms in terms of uh, adding or removing a point versus changing a point. Uh, you'll see both definitions. And in very rare cases, this makes a difference, but roughly speaking, the idea of adding, removing, changing a point are equivalent up to a factor of two. Uh, where, so don't, don't worry too much about that specific detail for the purposes of this tutorial. Cool. So that's everything I want to say about uh, the definition itself. Again, it's a little bit of a mouthful, just, but think of it, again, as preserving the probability distribution over outputs in some very specific and precise way that you know we could discuss for several hours about why this is exactly the right way and why Many other ways are not good enough. So let's, what, what can you do with differential privacy? What does it protect against and what doesn't it protect against? Um, at a high level, the way I like to say what it protects against is learning anything about a user that you couldn't have inferred without them. And my claim is, I'll, I'll say this again in the next slide, but it does exactly that, nothing more and nothing less. But it protects against, for example, database reconstruction. If you have some database and it only gives differentially private answers, then uh, that implies that based on those answers, you won't be able to reconstruct the data set. Um, it also protects against membership inference, like I mentioned before. Uh, and I don't have it on the slide, but also say that, uh, again, that example of leaking your training data as GPT-2, it protects against things like that as well. Because obviously, a user's individual data point is something that is sort of very bespoke to them and something that you'd protect with this definition. I think even more important than what it does protect against is what it doesn't protect against. I think this one point is the most conceptually important part of uh, the definition, which you'll see even experts in uh, the field of privacy sometimes misunderstand uh, this important point, which is that sometimes people claim that a privacy leakage happened, uh, but in my opinion, it didn't actually happen. Um, in particular, differential privacy allows you to still do uh, machine learning and statistics. And that is inferences about a population, which are not specific to one individual. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, suppose someone is publicly known to be a smoker, and they are asked to participate in a study to investigate whether smoking causes cancer. And they're a little bit uneasy because, you know, what if everyone knows that uh, because I smoke, then I'm going to get cancer in the future, and so my insurance premiums will rise. But, oh, they tell me it's differentially private, so, like, it doesn't matter. I'll participate in the study. So they participate in the study, and then it's found that smoking causes cancer. The person's insurance premiums rise. Um, so they kind of were exactly what, they ha what happened. Uh, exactly what they were afraid of happened. And you might be asking, was their differential privacy violated? But when you think about it, no, it wasn't, because whether they participated or not, 
the conclusion still holds that smoking causes cancer. Uh, you know, this is not their secret. It's a secret about nature that they was just discovered. So differential privacy is really about trying to make, uh, prevent, protect these individual secrets that are really yours to hold and keep, not things about nature itself. So that's an important distinction that uh, I think a lot of papers uh, seem to miss at some points. So yeah, like I, I like to say, differential privacy in terms of an operational definition, it guarantees that the output of the algorithm is simple, similar whether or not someone participates. Nothing more and nothing less. I'll, I'll mention there's also other things which are, you'll, you'll hear private referred to in a lot of other settings, um, but it's not appropriate in every setting. For example, uh, one thing is private contact tracing where, you know, especially in COVID, where maybe I had COVID, so I need to know who else I interacted with, and so I can trace it back to someone. This is, you know, the word private used in a very different sense because you really need individual identities for this, which uh, differential privacy really erases kind of individual data points in some sense. Cool. So that's the, uh, that, that's some discussion of what it can and can't do. And it's a very popular definition for a number of reasons, uh, which I'm going to basically spend the rest of the uh, talk going over, we've kind of already talked about the fact that this is a rigorous notion uh, of privacy in the sense that you prove that an algorithm is differentially private. It's not measured how private it is. You give a proof, and then therefore, this is like an information theoretic fact that privacy is guaranteed. And it's also quantitative, which is important as well. So we've talked about this already. And the reason why it's so easy to work with differential privacy is because there's a very nice toolbox of algorithmic building blocks and uh, machine learning tools, which you can kind of put them together in the right way using also definitional properties of differential privacy, which allow you to make, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you first some very, very simple algorithms which are private. And then you might be thinking, how, how could you do anything useful with that? They seem like too basic to be able to do anything meaningful. But then I'll show you how to train an arbitrary machine learning model with even just the most basic of facts. So I think this is rather uh, remarkable how you know how you can build things, which makes it incredibly convenient. So cool. The next uh, segment will be focusing, like I promised, on some of the basic algorithms and tools. You know, I told you an algorithm is differentially private. Uh, if, if an algorithm is differentially private, it means it satisfies this. But how do we come up with some actually differential private algorithms? And I'll give you two examples of differentially private algorithms. The first one is probably the first algorithm that anyone knows when they uh, start in differential privacy known as the Laplace mechanism. Um, I'll, I'll mention for weird historical reasons, sometimes the term mechanism is used in place of algorithms. Uh, think of them interchangeably. It's a weird term, but that's how they call them. So let's start with a very simple example. Suppose our data set is X1 through Xn, where each thing is just a bit, zero or one. And you can think of this as maybe whether someone smokes or doesn't smoke. Uh, and our goal is to estimate how many people in the data set smoke. And we want to do this privately while respecting uh, individual privacy and the notion of differential privacy that we just talked about. So how might we do this? One of the key quantities which underlies a lot of algorithms in differential privacy is what's known as the sensitivity. That is, given this function that we care about, the function we want to privatize, which here is just the sum of the bits, how much can it change if a single data point is modified? And you can see, in, in this case, if you think about it, thinking about an arbitrary data set, uh, you can really change a zero to one, or maybe change a one to a zero. But if you think about it, the sensitivity, is just going to be one. It's a very, very insensitive function. And intuitively, this is an important quantity in differential privacy because you know, we're trying to hide individual contributions in some rigorous way. So if a function is insensitive, that means it's easier to privatize, intuitively speaking. Whereas if it's very sensitive, it jumps around a lot if you change one person's data point, then it's gonna be harder to privatize. But luckily in this case, it's a fairly insensitive, you know, it can change by just one, not, not too big in this case. And my claim, differentially private algorithm, what you do is you take your function, your sum function here, you add noise, which is distributed according to Laplace distribution, which I'll tell you in a sec. And my claim is that this is epsilon zero differentially private. So Laplace noise, that's the PDF, but uh, maybe, you know, the way to think about it is a two-sided exponential distribution. Exponential distribution goes like this. You just mirror it on the left and right. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is how you privatize a function. You add noise, which looks kind of like that, uh, you know, curve right there. 
So, you know, these right here, in fact, are if you had the value f of x, then you wouldn't just output f of x, you would output a sample from this orange distribution. Similarly, if you had f of x prime, you wouldn't just output f of x prime, you'd output a sample from this blue distribution. So I'll just comment on that as a, as a sort of aside. Differentially private algorithms are always going to be basically samples from a distribution. You output a random draw. And I'm not going to prove to you why this is differentially private. Here's a proof by picture if you really stare at it. But the point is the PDF ratio here is bounded by e to the epsilon. And therefore, um, it guarantees exactly that definition that I showed you before. But yeah, you can, you can, if you stare at this picture long enough, maybe it'll make sense. But I'm not going to go too into that. And let's make it a little bit more concrete. That's, that's the idea. We take uh, this, the sum, and then we add Laplace noise. So to make it concrete, imagine you know, the same example, how many smoke. Suppose 20 people, that is f of x equals 20. Uh, and you can guarantee 1 comma 0 differential privacy by adding uh, Laplace 1 noise. Oh, one, one thing I want to really say here is note that uh, you know, this is a quantitative definition in the sense that if you want stronger privacy, that is epsilon being smaller, then you would add more noise. Say, you know, 1 over 0 0.1 would be Laplace 10, which is more noise. Whereas if you have a larger epsilon, say even epsilon equals infinity, then uh, this would be. Uh, a smaller standard deviation of the uh, of the noise that you introduce. So essentially, more private uh, introduces more noise, whereas less private introduces less noise. So this is one example, and I did a few samples. And for example, this twenty, when you uh, privatize it using epsilon one comma zero differential privacy, you get things which are pretty close to the right answer, twenty point six eight, so on. But suppose you want stronger privacy, you want to get 0 0.1 comma 0 differential privacy, then you have to add more noise uh, of magnitude roughly 10. And some samples from the output you can see here, some are pretty good, you know, 22.45 is pretty close to 20, some are much smaller, like 2.4, which is, you know, natural, you wanted more privacy, you're going to get worse accuracy, and that's a common tension in differential privacy. Cool, so this is the Laplace mechanism for this simple example. Let's make it a little bit more general than just, you know, adding sums. I'll try to state it in its full generality. Um, suppose you have some function of interest, which takes in a sensitive data set and outputs, say, a real vector. So now we're not just going to be focusing on a sum, or sorry, on, on a one-dimensional sum. It could be anything that maps to a d-dimensional vector. And we're going to let this quantity here be the L1 sensitivity. That's a, that's a mouthful. So, like, think about it in terms of these words. The math backs it up. But... Uh, how much can this function that we care about change if we modify one data point? And so notice that this is a worst case over every single data set and every data set that uh, could be neighboring to it. So really looking in the worst case, how sensitive could this function be? Like we saw before, it was just one for the sum of zeros and ones, but in general, it could be much larger. And uh, in particular, we measure how big the function difference is in the L1 uh, norm. And here's the sort of general Laplace uh, theorem, mechanism theorem, which is that if you take your function and you add Laplace noise to each of the coordinates, uh, in words I say it here, yeah, you add Laplace noise to each of the coordinates, uh, then this is going to be epsilon zero differentially private. And just to emphasize how big the noise is, you'll note that in the numerator of the size of the noise, it's the L1 sensitivity. So that kind of matches the intuition I said before, where if it is more sensitive, then you have to add more noise because it's harder to privatize, whereas if it's less sensitive, then you have to add less noise. Similarly, once again, when you want epsilon to be smaller, that necessitates more noise, and if epsilon is larger, that necessitates less noise. So the magnitude of the noise kind of matches on those two things uh, we care about. It's bigger if you have a sensitive function or if you want stronger privacy guarantees. Cool. And just to make this one a little bit more concrete, I'm going to give you an example on private histogram. There's a very common thing that you'd want to know for a data set, uh, you know, number of data points that fall into each of K categories. Say, like, here is a data set and someone's weight in pounds, and, you know, this is, this is what a, a potential non-privatized data set could look like. But, of course, maybe weights are sensitive, so maybe you want to privatize this histogram. And I'm not going to work through the details, but essentially the Laplace mechanism, you can privatize this by uh, adding Laplace 1 over epsilon noise to each of these different counts, each of the bins can is essentially perturbed. And, you know, you get something that looks like this, for example. Um, you can see how it changes from the original counts to something a little bit different. Some numbers went up, some numbers went down. But uh, if we work through the analysis, you'd see that this is differentially private. And then you can release these, uh, these you know, privatized counts 
for someone to do data analysis on. Yeah, I claim that they are going to be epsilon zero DP. Cool, so Laplace mechanism is the first thing everyone learns and it's kind of the most useful one. Uh, so I won't make such a strong statement. There's lots of useful algorithms. Um, and another useful one, which is very similar, is the Gaussian mechanism. You know, I, I, I'm, this is very similar to before, so I'm not gonna, you know, go into all the details, but it's almost identical. I highlighted the changes in red, but um, the, the, the thing I wanna get away here, take, the thing I want you to take away here is, instead of adding Laplace noise, which is, you know, very sort of, un, if you're not familiar with differential privacy, you might be wondering why, why Laplace noise? And the reason is because it fits the definition perfectly and kind of works for that. But another common thing you might do is adding Gaussian noise. And essentially this slide says that uh, you can add Gaussian noise instead of Laplace noise and it'll still be private. And I could walk you through you know, all the terms, but the same sort of things happen. In particular, if, it, if it's more sensitive, then uh, you have to add more noise to guarantee privacy and uh, so on. The, there, there's two differences I really wanna highlight here. Uh, I, I have some Gaussians, you know what a Gaussian looks like probably. Um, the main thing I want to highlight here are the differences between the Laplace and Gaussian mechanisms. So the, the similarity, first of all, is like, like I sort of said, they're both noise addition mechanisms. That is, you take the uh, function, which is non-private, and you add noise to it either from a Laplace or Gaussian distribution. So they're similar in that way. But uh, the difference is, is that the Gaussian uh, distribution, the Gaussian mechanism, uh, it often la adds less noise than Laplace. And the reason is because uh, one of the details which I didn't say in the last slide is that interestingly you add noise according to the L2 sensitivity rather than the L1 sensitivity and uh, just one fact which may not be obvious to everyone is that the L2 norm is always at most the L1 norm so therefore there's going to be less noise added. Um, on the other hand while it's a essentially necessitates less noise the downside is that it uh, gives you a weaker privacy notion that is known as epsilon delta dp, instead of Laplace, the Laplace mechanism is epsilon comma zero dp. So it weakens your privacy notion, but you add less noise. I, I didn't really tell you uh, like, you know, is that a bad thing? Is that a good thing? I'm going to claim that most of the time epsilon delta dp in most applications is going to be good enough. In particular, if you're asking a lot of queries on the same data set, uh, you know, maybe you want to do more than just finding out how many people smoke in a data set, you want to do many queries, then uh, you're going to use something called advanced composition, which necessitates a prox DP, uh, which we'll talk about in a few slides. But really, the, the, the point I'm trying to get at here is that, um, yeah, Gauss, the Gaussian mechanism for many intents and purposes is good enough. In particular, we'll see when we're using, when we're training a machine learning model privately, that's kind of the only way that we're going to do it. Cool, so these are just two basic uh, mechanisms and you might be thinking that, okay, you've taught me two, two things which are, you know, you take a function, you add noise, is everything in differential privacy just doing noise addition? And the answer is no, there's many other things which uh, I don't have time to get into. Um, there's one thing, you know, I, it was heartbreaking, I had to cut the exponential mechanism, which is my favorite algorithm in differential privacy. Um, randomized response is another kind of different thing, sparse vector. Uh, these are other primitives which are commonly used and, you know, basic tools in your arsenal that you should have if you're doing differentially private algorithm design. And these are nice to have in your toolbox because they're useful in building more complex procedures. And as I'll sort of explain, you can put these tools together in the right ways and they'll give you something more mature, uh, sorry, allow you to build basically a more uh, complex system uh, which does more than just output, you know, how many people smoke privately. And we'll see some examples of that. But hopefully I've gotten across to you in this segment that there's some very simple algorithms which guarantee differential privacy in simple settings. So that's great. Um, and like I said, I promised you we'll be able to do something useful with these, which is more complex than just uh, sums, but, but we'll put a pin in that. Cool. So for the next, uh, the next segment, I'm going to talk about properties of differential privacy. That is, you know, we have this definition, we have some algorithms, but if that was it, then it would be restricted to doing very basic things. So I'm gonna tell you some convenient properties which make it very user-friendly in my opinion. And there's three properties I wanna focus on. One is called post-processing. And in words, 
This says uh, you can't undo privatization of something which is released under the constraint of differential privacy. So what that says is, you know, suppose we started with 20 people smoked in the data set and uh, we add noise and it says 22.47 people uh, smoked. Uh, there's no way given, if I give you the 22.47, there's no way you can like stare at that really hard and say, oh, there must've been 20 people actually in the data set. Uh, you can't undo privatization. Uh, yeah, basically, you know, every, when something is released privately into the wild under differential privacy, that, that guarantee just holds. And the math, more mathematical way of saying this is as follows. If we let M be a differentially private algorithm and F is just something which is arbitrary, it's an arbitrary function. Then if you compute M on some data set and then compute F on the output, uh, that's going to be differentially private as well. So it's saying, uh, you know, the composition of any uh, function. So I'm not gonna use the term composition because that's confusing for what I'll say later, but basically running an arbitrary function, which doesn't look at the data again on the output of a differentially private algorithm is, is not gonna somehow magically violate privacy. So that's very convenient because we'll see later you know, we're going to train a machine learning model privately. And then after that, we're going to give it to the users. They can do whatever they want with it. And we still have the very strong guarantee that we're not going to reveal things about the training data set. So this is a very important property. Another thing is group privacy. You might be thinking like, I talked about neighboring data sets, you know, one data point is added or removed, one data point is changed. But what if K points are changed? For example, uh, you know, maybe, maybe two people are uncertain about whether their privacy will be preserved together. Maybe jointly, uh, their privacy could be violated. But the nice thing about differential privacy is just by reasoning about neighbor, reasoning about neighboring data sets, the privacy loss degrades, uh, gracefully, uh, when you consider things which are maybe two spaces away or three spaces away, um, there's maybe multiple changes. And here is the group privacy theorem, which is it's going to look very similar to the definition of differential privacy. So it's a little bit of a mouthful in the exact same way. Don't focus on too much of it. In particular, ignore this term over here. The main thing I want you to focus on is the fact that instead of differing in one entry, we're saying that X and X prime differ in K entries. And then instead of having E to the epsilon here, we have E to the K epsilon. So this is kind of uh, the, the natural thing that maybe you would expect. Uh, you know, if you set K equals to one, then this just recovers the original definition of differential privacy, but you know, allowing more changes uh, weakens the weakens the privacy guarantee in some sort of predictable and smooth-ish way. Cool. Um, of these three properties, I'm going to show you this is probably the least important, uh, but uh, it's still an important one. The most important one by far in my mind is composition. Composition is a very very powerful pr uh, property which lets us. Uh, do things with differential privacy. If it didn't exist, then we'd be stuck with very basic things like you compute one sum and then you give up, uh, you're done. Like the intuitive idea is suppose I ask, you know, multiple queries about the same data set, say I want to know how many women in my data set smoke. And then maybe I also wanna know how many men in the data set are over 18 uh, up to 25 or something. If I ask multiple queries of the same data set, intuitively somehow, we're giving out more data about the sensitive data set. And therefore, you know, the privacy weakens when we do multiple queries, but it's unclear, it's not immediately obvious how to quantify this sort of thing. Like if I do uh, three disclosures, which are differentially private, then what happens? Is that still differentially private or not? And uh, the, the nice thing is that differential privacy this is why I think it's so useful and powerful is because it allows us to quantify how things uh, degrade when we have multiple queries on the same data set. So here is the basic composition theorem, uh, which, you know, the plain text description is below. Basically, suppose you have a bunch of differentially private algorithms and you run them all on the same data set and you release all of their outputs. Then the result is going to be basically what you would get by adding up the privacy parameters. For example, suppose they're all epsilon delta differentially private, then uh, K uh, algorithms run will be the overall release of all of those will be K epsilon comma K delta differentially private. So this is, you know, very convenient because like that, if, if I had to, if you had to guess how the privacy would be leaked, uh, how the privacy would degrade by multiple outputs, it's exactly what you probably would guess, you know, you just add things up and it works out very nicely. 
So let me give you an example uh, of, you know, I'll, I'll mention again, like this is what's going to be really the workhorse, something like this that allows us to build more complex procedures rather than just uh, releasing, say, you know, sums. But one example I want to give you is, for example, is there's a population of 100 people. And say, you know, first of all, we know 20 of them are smokers. We can privatize this uh, with Laplace one noise and we get say 19.51. Suppose additionally, 37 have some sort of chronic illness, privatize this, we get 36.89. And 12 people have a high income of at least 250,000 a year. And we privatize that and it gives us 12.53, uh, let's say. Now, my claim is that if we release, if we release each, any one of these in isolation, that would be one comma zero differentially private. But since we're releasing these three statistics, which are each one comma zero differentially private, it, the overall release is going to uh, give three comma zero differential privacy. So yeah, it shows how you can add, uh, you can ask multiple queries on the same data set and uh, quantify how much, you know, how private that is or not. The downside is that these, these add up really fast uh, in the sense that if you do a hundred or a thousand or a million queries, then you pay a million times the privacy cost in these parameters and that can add up really fast. Um, there are some cases where uh, we'll get into, where you might want to do many, many queries on the same data set, and therefore this is, uh, this is not good. Can we do better? And fortunately, yes, the answer is yes. There's some tool called advanced composition, which essentially allows us to ask more queries for the same, uh, for the same uh, privacy cost. So I'll just you know, flash, this is the basic composition, which I had before, where the parameters add up. Here is the advanced composition theorem, which uh, is a little bit informal. There's some details I'm hiding, but very roughly speaking, by more careful analysis, you can actually show that instead of just adding up the parameters, you know, paying a cost of k, then you can pay a cost of square root k instead, which is in many cases dramatically smaller. For example, just to, to give a kind of quantitative comparison, this isn't totally precise. Suppose, uh, if you do 100 queries on a data set, if you just use basic composition, then for the same privacy cost, you can uh, do 10,000 queries using advanced composition, roughly speaking, not, not totally accurate, but something along those lines. So this shows you that essentially you should, in most cases, be trying to use advanced composition when you have many queries, because this allows you to do more analyses on your data for the same privacy cost uh, that you would get under basic composition. And this is really, really uh, powerful and important, the fact that we can do so many analyses on one data set uh, without the privacy going totally out of hand. So, okay, let's recap uh, what we've talked about so far. We've talked about differential privacy and its properties, uh, like these things, as well as, you know, private mechanisms, including Laplace and Gaussian mechanism. Uh, now, I want to fulfill the promise I made to you and show you some of the things you can actually do. So I'll show you briefly a few applications where differentially private differential privacy has been used and then during the last segment we'll show how to pray, uh, train a model under differential privacy so some examples of where it's been used this is one thing which uh in the wake of uh covid19 when it started uh google started releasing these community mobility reports which are uh differentially privatized so what this shows is essentially uh in various different locations how many people were in retail and recreation? How many people were at transit stations compared to pre-COVID? You can see, for example, uh, not as many people were in transit stations in Waterloo region uh, or workplaces, whereas more people were staying at home, kind of what you expect. Um, but this uses people's location data, which is clearly very sensitive. You wouldn't want your you know, location where you went all times of the day to be released. So they released these using differential privacy. And that protects people's location data when still finding aggregate uh, statistics over a population of where people are going. Another uh, very high profile and perhaps, I, in my opinion, the most important application of differential privacy so far has been in the 2020 U.S. Census. Uh, if you were in the United States on April 1st, 2020, your data was run through a differentially private algorithm. Uh, and this is very important because, for example, it's used to uh, do allocation of a lot of federal budget up to $675 billion, uh, at least, at least that much. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people who are depending very much on 
the uh, outcome of the uh, census information. And yeah, this has been a, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, competing interests here in particular, I think, uh, you know, this is one of the few things in, uh, I'm, I'll not say that, but uh, there's literally been federal lawsuits involving differential privacy as an algorithm, uh, which, you know, some stakeholders feel like this is violating their ability to get uh, clear numbers. But if you want to preserve privacy, which the Census Bureau is mandated by law to do, this is kind of the way you have to do it. So this is an ongoing discussion, in fact, between social scientists and, uh, uh, private, uh, and statisticians who are, you know, interested in preserving privacy. And the last one I'll mention is uh, private machine learning, which we'll go into a bit more depth. But I thought this was really cool. Uh, a recent deployment about a year ago, uh, where essentially the next word prediction in the Spanish language uh, Google keyboard, the Gboard, uh, it is trained using differentially private uh, federated learning. Well, we'll not worry about federated learning today, but um, really using differential privacy guarantees. And as to best of their, their knowledge and mind, this is the first production neural net trained directly on user data announced with a formal DP guarantee. So yeah, I think that's pretty cool that essentially, you know, even based on these simple things like, you know, noise addition and uh, composition, they essentially built something on top of it, which is able to work in your phone and uh, give you private next word predictions. And for the rest of this talk, I'll tell you, you know, some of ideas of how uh, that's done. I'm not gonna go into full detail and I'm not gonna tell you specifically their algorithm. I'm gonna tell you something a bit simpler but it'll give you an idea how even these complicated machine learning models can be uh, trained privately in a surprisingly simple way. So just to recall, you know, there's a slide I had earlier. We're gonna, you can try to think of a common use case as trying to prevent uh, outputting parts of the training data verbatim. That's an example. Uh, the idea is we want some sort of machine learning model we can put out into the wild where anyone in the world can look at it and no matter what they ask of it, even if they look at the weights, maybe they uh, you know, ask it all sorts of weird queries, nonetheless, it shouldn't be able to violate the privacy of the training data set in the way uh, that we care about. For example, amongst other things, it shouldn't violate, uh, pre it should prevent against disclosures and just leaking uh, data points verbatim. And you know, let's, let's build our way up on how to do this. Well, suppose we didn't care about privacy. What we would do is just use gradient descent, which is the standard method to train ML models. You might be thinking that, okay, maybe stochastic gradient descent is what maybe people might use. Put a, put a pin in that, we'll return to it. Let's focus on gradient descent first. And I don't think I need to tell maybe anyone in this room what gradient descent is. Essentially, you have some data set. What you do is you compute the average gradient, take a negative step, uh, a step in the negative direction of the gradient, and repeat. So this is gradient descent, non-privately, hopefully familiar to most people here. The nice thing is we'll say just see just a few tweaks to this procedure, two very simple and intuitive tweaks, will make it into something which is differentially private. So the, the differentially private gradient descent, or DPGD, is the following. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start again by computing the gradient of every point in the data set, but then we're gonna do this clipping operation to make sure the L2 norm of the points is bounded. So to give you an illustration of what that looks like, you can see here, suppose this black uh, arrow here is our gradient for some data point. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to essentially clip it or project it to this ball of L2 radius. Essentially, just if any gradient is too big in magnitude, clip it, shrink it down to this ball. And intuitively, uh, going back to the principle I mentioned before about the sensitivity being an important uh, feature, if you didn't have clipped gradients, then the sensitivity of an average could be unbounded. You could have an incredibly large uh, gradient, which would just totally uh, violate privacy of one individual point, potentially. So what we're going to do is we're going to clip essentially to limit the sensitivity of the average gradient. So once we've done this, then we do as before. We uh, we, we average the gradients, but then the last step uh, which comes in for introducing privacy is we add Gaussian noise to the average gradient. And then the rest, other two steps are the exact same. You take a step, repeat K times for some large value of K. But so I just wanna emphasize the two differences between gradient descent and private gradient descent are you clip the individual gradients and then you add Gaussian noise. That's it, very, very simple and intuitive in my mind. Uh, changes. Now, you might be wondering, why, why is this private? Why, why is this at all a reasonable thing to do? Well, I claim that this is exactly the things I've told you already, 
In particular, if you look at steps one and two, addition of Gaussian noise to a function with bounded sensitivity is exactly the Gaussian mechanism, which I told you before, adding Gaussian noise. And okay, that's one step. But in fact, since you repeat it k times, it's essentially doing the Gaussian mechanism k times. And therefore, we're going to use advanced composition to argue that releasing all k of these iterates is also going to be differentially private just using advanced composition. So that's it. Like, really, this is how you train a machine learning model privately. You do the Gaussian mechanism a bunch of times, and, and, and it works. Um, yeah, and, and the analysis, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be belabor this too much, but it's very, very simple. Suppose, you know, you set the parameters right for how much noise you add, uh, and such that one step of DPGD is going to be epsilon delta differentially private. Well, then, you know, k steps just using this advanced composition theorem uh, will give you that the overall privacy disclosure is epsilon root k and delta prime for some, I'm, I'm not going to get into what delta prime is, but essentially just use it advanced composition. And that's the simplest way to do uh, analysis of private gradient descent. That's it. Like, like you, you know everything right now to train a machine learning model with differential privacy. It's very, very simple change to uh, the standard procedure. Um, this is not going to be, a, this is not the best way to do it in the sense that you need to do better accounting. Like there's additional tricks you can do. Like one, one thing I'll mention, oh, sorry. Yeah. An important thing is the fact that uh, the final model is going to be private by post-processing in the sense that, you know, I tell you that the iterates in gradient descent are going to be private, but in particular, a function you do with this, uh, these iterates is basically just release the final model and after that, I can give this out to anyone in the world, and by post-processing, they won't be able to violate the privacy uh, of the training data set. So the downside of this method uh, is that, you know, nobody in practice for very large problems might use full batch gradient descent. They might use a uh, stochastic gradient descent. And the fortunate thing is it's very easy to adapt it to that. I just want to start with a simple case. You can see really this is just the Gaussian mechanism, but stochastic gradient descent is almost the same thing. The one difference is that you do some random mini batches or you know ordered mini batches from the data set, and then you average over each of these mini batches and repeat. And it's very easy to uh, just basically plug this into DPGD and it becomes DPSGD now, where the first step is just randomly sampling a batch of points of whatever size. I'll comment that there's, a, like I said uh, before, I gave you a simple analysis, but there are better analyses you can do in particular, the, the, I'm not going to get into this technically, but there's an intuitive fact that, okay, we're just randomly sampling a set of points. Suppose our over, overall data set is a million points, but we just subsample a mini batch of size, say, uh, 64 or 128. Well, intuitively, that should give us some pri better privacy, right? Because we're not even looking at the whole data set for that query. So there's a property known as privacy amplification by sampling or privacy amplification by subsampling, um, which improves... Uh, sorry, that should be a B, um, which improves the privacy just based on the fact that we're only looking at a subset of the data. So if, if you didn't follow that, don't worry. But the main thing is that like I introduced another new thing, which is used to uh, analyze privacy in this type of setting. And then there's more tricks you can do as well. Things like what are known as moments accountants. Uh, there's fi uh, fast Fourier transform uh, methods to do privacy counting. But if, if you're more careful and clever with the math, then you can basically give her better private analyses of the exact same algorithm. And this might sound complicated, but the good thing is that, you know, all of these analyses and, uh, and uh, you know, implementation details, which are kind of tricky, you have to work through them, uh, are, they're tough, but you don't have to do any of that work. The good thing is that there's very mature tools at this point, you know, the same wouldn't be true, say, 10 years ago, but now there's, say, Opacus and TensorFlow Privacy, which are very mature and useful tools where uh, you, you can train a model privately. And, you know, if anyone here is interested, like you can basically go back to your computer and uh, probably if, you've, if you are comfortable training machine learning models within like less than an hour, you can get a private machine learning models trained on some basic MNIST cases. It's not, it's not that hard. These are very nice with great tutorials uh, available. So now the big question is, does this really work? You know, I've told you how to train a model privately. It's going to be private. But is it any good? And yeah, let's, let's see. I'll, I'll just go over to basically conclude a few uh, simple cases and show you what, what, what is known in terms of private machine learning on some classic benchmarks. A natural place to start for any uh, 
question is MNIST. Non privately, you can get effectively 100% accuracy on MNIST, you know, close enough. And privately, you can get with pretty reasonable privacy parameters 98 or 99% accuracy. So it seems like differentially private machine learning is pretty good for, say, uh, MNIST. It gets a lot harder, even for the next data set, to be honest, uh, CIFAR 10, uh, which you know, most people here I think are familiar with, but non privately, you can get, say, 98% accuracy. But privately, the state of the art is kind of a lot worse, uh, you know, with various different privacy parameters, there's different things you can get. But even in the best case, uh, with epsilon equals eight, you'll see that the error jumps from, say, 2% to almost 18%. So this is, you know, much worse than what you would get without privacy. And this is kind of, people put a lot of work into trying to improve this. I think these results are actually very nice uh, that they're able to do so well, because it's not an easy problem. And in some sense, one of the faults for this is because CIFAR 10 is a relatively small data set for the complexity of the task that we're doing. And, you know, for harder tasks like ImageNet, uh, you know, all bets are off, non-privately, maybe you can get like 87% top one accuracy, but privately, even with Epsilon 8, the state of the art is 32% uh, accuracy and even this was very difficult to achieve. Like, I think this is very impressive that we were able to even able to get that. So the kind of takeaway from this is that if you want to do private machine learning for complicated tasks, it can be, it can be kind of challenging. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's still far behind uh, non-private machine learning. There's a lot of stuff to do. I'll mention in the very last part of this that, you know, one recent trend which I've been interested in, others have been interested in, which can alleviate a lot of these issues is using public data for private machine learning, which is kind of a common trend even in the non-private setting. In the sense, pre-training and fine-tuning is a common paradigm now in, a, in the non-private setting, and that lends itself very nicely to differential privacy. The intuition is maybe first you can pre-train a model with, uh, say, public data, uh, say, just downloading images from the internet, uh, say, Google image search results. And then after that, once you've done something like that, you can fine tune the model privately using DPSGD with uh, sensitive data. And for example, imagine you want to do chest X-ray classification. This might be privacy sensitive. Uh, yeah, and you would train this with DPSGD. So you can see how I'm kind of delineating the data set into one data set, which is public and there's no privacy consideration, just use it as normal, but then fine tune with privacy. And this helps a lot. Um, we have some works on language models, which uh, I'm not going to mention, but it, the, the utility is very good. Um, but I'm going to tell you about some recent works uh, on ImageNet, which you can see here with even very small privacy budgets, uh, then you still get very high accuracy compared to the state of the art, which is, I guess, I don't know, either 87, 91%, somewhere around there. But the point is it's very close to uh, the non-private state of the art. Uh, that you can get. So essentially, it seems that public data can alleviate many of the problems with private machine learning's utility. And so I think it's a very promising direction to move forward. There's a few caveats here, including, for example, if you know what JFT4B is, this is not a public data set. Uh, it's a proprietary Google data set. Um, so there, there's, some, uh, I, there's some critiques which uh, myself, Florian, and uh, Nicholas Carlini have, um, but I'm not going to get into that today. Uh, but yeah, I think this is an interesting direction to moving forward. But in conclusion, uh, I just want to wrap up and say differential privacy is a strong and useful privacy notion. Uh, I've told you about a bunch of fundamental tools and building blocks and a bunch of convenient properties which make it possible to build convenient, uh, to build much more complex systems out of these. In particular, how to do private machine learning, which, you know, just just given Gaussian noise addition and repeating that many times, it's shocking to me that something can actually, like that can actually give real models which are private and so effectively. So if you wanna learn more, I'm, I wanna link a few resources like uh, Nicholas mentioned. Uh, I have a course which is on YouTube and you know, there's full lecture notes, uh, videos, uh, check it out. We also have a resource known as differentialprivacy.org. Uh, me and a few friends run and uh, curate this. It includes some blog posts, as well as, I think the most important part is a link to a bunch of resources, uh, which may be uh, useful, uh, you know, if to anyone getting started. There's other classes as well. For example, John Allman and Adam Smith have a wonderful course there too, with uh, full videos, as well as other people too. So yeah, that, I'll conclude with this. Thank you.